Go ahead. Let's do. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm going to give everyone a sec to come in from the waiting room. Okay. All right. Nice crowd today. Nice group of people. Okay, I see some familiar faces from, from the My Jewish Learning Dafyomi study, and I see some faces I don't recognize. So that's wonderful. I'm so glad you're all here. All right. Um, my name is Rachel Scheinerman. I'm the editor of My Jewish Learning, and we are here today to talk about Hanukkah. So, um, hi, Rob. Nice to see you. Okay. So, Hanukkah, that's, let's remind ourselves, is coming up. It's that day that we remember that the evil king Antiochus Epiphanes IV imposed all kind of evil religious persecutions and then completely defiled the Holy Temple in Jerusalem until a brave band of Jewish heroes called the Maccabees fought him off and restored and rededicated the temple. And that is why it's called Hanukkah, because Hanukkah means dedication. Okay, that's the usual story we hear about Hanukkah on one foot. And today we're going to take a look at it through the lens of the Talmud and see what it has to say about this story and see if we see it any differently by the end of the hour. So I'm excited to do this with you. Um, okay, and thank you to my colleague uh, Mara, who is going to work the slides in the background so that I can keep an eye on the comments. All right, so. The Talmud. Um, many of you have joined us for a lot of Talmud study, but even if you haven't, you probably have an intuition that the Talmud has a lot to say on Jewish holidays. Um, and if you've been through Dafumi's study, you spent, I think, at least a year on this material, right? We, we had some almost... 200, 300 pages on Shabbat, but then we had long discussions of Passover and Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot and even Purim. But what does the Talmud say about Hanukkah? Does anyone know? If you know, I'd love you to tell me in the comments, because if you did Daf, if you're doing Daf Yumi with us, which is the program of studying Talmud a page a day, you might recall that we haven't done a tractate on Hanukkah and we've gone through all of the tractates about festivals. So what does, if anything, does the Talmud have on Hanukkah? Do folks know? Um, you're welcome to put what you know in the chat. Okay. Um, Rob says the Talmud says where to put the lights. You put them in the window. Um, they ask what it means. They ask about candle lighting. Yep. Denise says there are four pages buried in the middle of the material on Shabbat. That's exactly correct. Um, four materials starting on Shabbat 21. That's the most extended discussion of Shabbat in the, uh, I'm sorry, of Hanukkah in the Talmud. It's in the middle of a discussion about Shabbat. And in that context, the rabbis are talking about lighting the Shabbat lights and they get somewhat sidetracked into a discussion of the Hanukkah lights. And that's where we see um, how and where and why to light the Hanukkah candle. We have the famous debate that people like to discuss between Hillel and Shammai about whether we increase the lights each night. We start with one the first night and then two and then three and so on up to eight nights. That's Hillel. Or according to Shammai, we start with eight lights and decrease down to one on the last night of Hanukkah. And it's also where we get the story of the miracle of the oil in the temple. Um, but other than that, uh, you guys are correct. There's really no sustained discussion of Hanukkah in the Talmud. And in fact, um, if my search function on Safari is correct, the word Maccabee doesn't even appear. Um, and so the question, my first question for you is why? Does anyone have an intuition about why the Talmud, which is so thorough in recording other Jewish holidays, is really very spare on Hanukkah? Aha. Okay. Rob says the Hanukkah events of 164 BCE are late. That could be one reason. Yep. Yep. Why glorify a military victory? Okay. Maybe there's anxiety about military victories. So if you read the Bible carefully, there's lots of glory about lots of military victories in the Bible. Wary of zealotry. Um, maybe the rabbis were ambivalent about the holiday. I think so. Um, I had a much simpler answer to all of this. I think these are all really good answers. I'd have simply much simpler answer, which is that maybe it's just because Hanukkah is not in the Bible, right? If the, it, maybe that's why the Talmud doesn't talk about it. Um, 
just not that important. That's right. So we're going to, so, so, um, so Hanukkah doesn't appear in the Hebrew Bible at all. It's not there. It's actually the only, uh, if I'm not mistaken, let me not say that. I think it's the only ancient holiday that's not in the Bible, but I'm not hundred percent sure if I'm wrong, tell me in the comments. Okay. So where does the holiday of Hanukkah even come from? How do we know it's a holiday? All right. The answer is, or one answer is from a document called Migilat Ta'anit. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Migilat Ta'anit now. Um, in the rabbinic period, the rabbis had this Migilat Ta'anit as a calendar. They had this calendar called Migilat Ta'anit, um, and it recorded a, a series of military triumphs and miraculous escapes of the Jewish people. And there were about 35 of them. Now, if you've study Talmud, you might know that the word ta'anit means fast, to fast. Um, and so this, the title of this document about all these victories is a little confusing. It's the, why are we calling it the scroll of fasting? And the answer is because these days of celebration are days when you are not allowed to fast. Okay. So Migila ta'anit, the scroll of fasting is about days when it is impermissible to fast. In the rabbinic world, if there was a public emergency, it was common to declare a fast to implore God to help fix the emergency. Um, but according to Miggy Latanit, on these 35-ish days, you're not allowed to do that. So, um, you know, these days we we often say that Judaism is all about, like, they tried to kill us, they failed, let's eat, okay, right? Um, back in the rabbinic period, when, when Miggy Latanit was operative, they, it was like that all the time, right? All the time. There are like 35 of these days. Um, uh, and here's something else you should know about Migilat Tani, this ancient calendar of celebrations when it's illegal, when, when it's not permissible to fast. Most of the dates on Migilat, in Migilat Tani record victories that took place during the Hasmonean era. Some are older and some are a little, um, some are a little more recent, but that seems to be the bulk of the calendar. So let me remind us briefly who the Hasmoneans are. Quick ancient history lesson. The Hasmoneans are a dynasty that ruled Israel from about 140 BCE, which is about 20 years after the defeat of Antiochus, all the way up to 37 BCE. So they had about a hundred year run. And their claim to fame is that they descend from one of Judah Maccabees' brothers. And so the Maccabees are considered the Hasmoneans as, Hasmoneans as well. And the thing you should know about the Hasmoneans from the rabbinic perspective is they were not great rulers. They were brutal, they were unpopular, and they were ultimately overtaken by Rome and basically became client rulers uh, until they were totally ousted by Herod the Great, who was also a client ruler of Rome, but now it was a new dynasty. It was the Herodian dynasty, and that lasted until the destruction of the temple. So the thing to know about the Hasmoneans, they were in there for about 100 years. They're descendants of the Maccabees, and the rabbis are not fans of them, Okay, which complicates their relationship to Hanukkah a lot. Um, the Hanukkah story, um, that therefore, which is about their ancestor, Judah Maccabee, and his clan, uh, may be seen as an important story that legitimizes uh, the Hasmonean rule. It may have served that function for the Hasmoneans, and it may be that the Hasmoneans promoted it heavily to legitimize their own control um, in the land of Israel um, between 130, what did I say, 140 and 37 BCE. Okay, so, so let's go back then to Migilat Ta'anit, which is that calendar that records all of these victories and days of celebration that you're not allowed to fast. Um, you may be thinking to yourself, hey, um, we don't actually celebrate these anymore, right? There are actually only two days on this calendar you're likely to be familiar with, and those are Hanukkah and Horam. And there's all this other stuff that most of us are not familiar with. And so the question is, why, right? Why of all these ancient celebrations, many of which felt a lot like Hanukkah and Purim, insofar as they celebrated these military victories and miracles that were performed for Israel, why did they fall out of use? Okay, so it turns out that the Talmud it discusses this question. So I'm going to, um, so Mara, we're ready for our first source here. Thank you. She's already got it up. Um, let's look here at Rosh Hashanah. Actually, this should be 19B. There we are. There we are. Okay. So here's the discussion. Why don't we celebrate 
most most of these days on Miggy Latani. Okay, as it is taught these days, which are written in Miggy Latani, both when the temple is standing and when the temple is not standing, are days on which fasting is prohibited. This is the statement of Rabbi Mayer. Okay, so Rabbi Mayer says that the days that the all the days written in Miggy Latani, this calendar of feasting days when you can't when you can't fast, all of them are still operative. That's his his tradition. When when the temple stood, they were operative, and when the now the temple has been destroyed, they're still operative. But his colleague Rabbi Yossi is going to disagree with him. Rabbi Yossi says when the temple is standing, these days are prohibited for fasting because these days are a source of joy for Israel. But when the temple is not standing, these days are permitted for fasting because they are a source of mourning for them. Okay, so Rabbi Yossi says that the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, that canceled Migilat Tanit. All those festivals in Migilat Tanit are canceled. Okay, I'm seeing some comments that are, uh, it looks to me like the slides are right. We should be on Rosh Hashanah 19b. We just finished the second paragraph with Rabbi Yossi. Okay, good. All right. So Rabbi Yossi's position, I think, um, is I think there I can understand both positions here actually right what Rabbi Meir thinks that just because the temple was destroyed doesn't mean we shouldn't celebrate these victories and Rabbi Yossi seems to be thinking that well it's strange to celebrate these military victories when the whole community is in such a deep state of mourning for the temple right you can imagine celebrating something like Hanukkah about the rededication uh, of the temple is strange when the temple lies in ruin. You can imagine, you know, for us, 2,000 years later, that might not seem so strange. But in for the rabbis in the wake of the destruction of the temple, you can imagine this felt would have felt strange. Okay, so how do we um, reconcile these two traditions about the calendar? Okay, this last paragraph on this slide. And the halakha is that these days were nullified, and the halakha there is that these days were not nullified. This is difficult as one halakha contradicts another, the other halakha. In other words, we have these two different traditions, one that they have been canceled, the, the festivals have been canceled, and one that they have not. And how do we reconcile it? And the answer is it is not difficult. Here's the reconciliation. Here it is referring to Hanukkah and Purim. There it is the rest of the days. Okay, in other words, all the days on Migilat Tanit are canceled. All those 35 um, days when you cannot mourn and you cannot fast are canceled, except for Hanukkah and Purim. They're the only two we're keeping. Um, so you can. So, so the question now is why these two? Why are we keeping Hanukkah and Purim when all these other victories, miracles, we're no longer um, we're we're no longer commemorating. We're no longer celebrating on a regular basis. Now, I think with Purim, the answer is fairly intuitive. Um, I think with Purim, it's, you know, we have Esther in the Bible, right? We have a whole book, the Bible about this miracle, and it specifically commands us to celebrate that miracle. So that's that victory. That's, that's clear. But why Hanukkah? Why Hanukkah? Okay, to get the answer to that, let's turn back one page in the Talmud. Um, so, Mary, you can flip us over to the next slide. This is Rosh Hashanah 18b. Okay, and they're going to explain, or at least they're going to try and figure it out. Okay, so there was an incident, start with the story, and the sages decreed a fast on Hanukkah in Lod. And Rabbi Ele Eliezer went and bathed, and Rabbi Yeshua went and cut his hair. Okay, so something bad happened. It's after the temple has been destroyed, something bad happened, and so the sages decree a fast. It happens to be during Hanukkah and Lod. And Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua, what they do is they buck the fast, right? Ali Rabbi Eliezer goes to, to the bathhouse and takes a nice soak. Rabbi Yeshua goes to the barber and gets his hair cut. These are things you don't do on a fast day when you're trying to convince the God of Israel to reverse some sort of crisis. And not only that, but they said to the others, go out and fast another fast for what you have already fasted. Okay. They say to the rest of them, you now have to fast in penance for, can for, for fasting on Hanukkah. All right. And so then the question, of course, is why? Rabbi, why are Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua making a stand to keep Hanukkah? Rabbi Yosef is going to try and explain. So Rabbi Yosef said, Hanukkah is different as it has a mitzvah. Okay, the reason we're keeping Hanukkah is because it has a mitzvah attached. 
which you we already know what it is because we peaked we we talked about that in tractate Shabbat. It's lighting a light. But Abaya says to him something really interesting. Abaya says, ah, let Hanukkah be nullified and let his mitzvah be nullified with it. We don't need it anymore. And therefore, we don't need the mitzvah either. We're, we can just get rid of them both. So Rav Yosef has to come back with another reason that we keep Hanukkah. So rather, Rav Yosef said, Hanukkah is different as its miracle is well known. So I want to pause here and, and see if I can get your reactions to this. Rav Yosef's statement, we have to keep Hanukkah because its miracle is well known. What do you think he's saying? I'm just, I'm just curious how, how folks read this. Why do, we, wh- why do we keep Hanukkah simply because its miracle is well known? Mary, you can uh, move us on to the next slide. Uh, be, okay. It, okay, I'm getting some answers. Okay. All right. You guys are seeing this the way I'm seeing this too, actually. Yeah. I think it's, it's established. It's popular. Um, culture is stronger than history. People love it. How would it look if we ignore it? Um, it's within the historical memory of the sages. Yeah. I think it's something like this. People like Hanukkah. People know this story. They like this story. They're attached to it. So we can't get rid of it. Um, okay. Let's, let's turn over to Yoma which um, has something very interesting to say now about the miracle of Hanukkah, this one that is well known. Um, Okay, so Rabbi Asi says, why was Esther likened to the dawn? Um, This may seem like a non sequitur, but um, it's a midrashic reading of a verse from Psalms that that the rabbis understand is alluding to Esther and being like the dawn. Um, And he says, it is to tell you, that just as the dawn is the conclusion of the entire night, so too Esther was the conclusion of all the miracles performed for the Jewish people. The very last miracle for the Jewish people was there was the miracle that was performed for them in the time of Esther that reversed Haman's, well, didn't reverse Haman's evil decree, but they, they succeeded in not, um, they succeeded in defending themselves. Okay. And if you, and if you have Vague sense of the history, you know, this is long before the Maccabees and the, the Maccabean revolt. So the Gemara asks, wait, what about Hanukkah? What about that miracle? Right? That came after. And the sages answer, ah, we're talking about miracles about which permission to, was granted to write them in the Bible. Okay, so here we have a statement. We've had a, we now have a statement that we celebrate Hanukkah because people like it and are attached to the miracle. That's really the only reason to celebrate it. And we also have a statement that we don't have, we never got permission to put the miracle of Hanukkah into the Bible. Okay. So we're sort of illuminating rabbinic thinking on this holiday. We have a a holiday that people like, but we don't, didn't have permission to write about it in the Bible. So why might they not have had permission to write about it in the Bible? Um, It turns out that we have biblical like texts that discuss the miracle of Hanukkah and the, and the most famous of the, and the fullest of these is first Maccabees. So let's take a look at that text and ask ourselves why maybe the rabbis felt it shouldn't be included in the Bible. So Mara, we're ready for the next slide. Okay. And I, I apologize. I brought a lot of text from Maccabees. It's, it's a long book. Um, and so we're going to try and I'm going to try and move us through it quickly. Um, Sorry, okay. I'm just having some slide issues here. One second. Sure. Right. OK, so this is this is we're mostly going to look at Maccabees first Maccabees chapter two. Um, I will summarize first Maccabees chapter one very quickly. Antiochus marked it, marched into Jerusalem and did terrible, terrible things. It was really bad. The persecutions were terrible. People suffered a lot. OK, now chapter two. In those days arose Mattathias, the son of John, the son of Simeon, a priest of the sons of Yoariv from Jerusalem and dwelt in Modin. By the way, I'm using the free translation on Sephari here. It's a little bit archaic, but uh, we'll go with it. And he had five sons. Um, Yoanan called Caddis, Simon called Thassus, Judas, who was called Maccabeus, Eleazar, who was called Avaran, and Jonathan, whose surname was Aphus. And when he saw the blasphemies that were committed in Judah and Jerusalem, he said, woe is me, 
to what end, therefore, shall we live any longer? Then Mattathias and his sons rent their clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned very sore. Aha, Maccabees, we have Lewis in um, Greek. There are Hebrew translations of it, but but the best manuscripts we have are in Greek. Okay, so Mattathias, this, this introduces us to Mattathias and his sons. Their first response to the catastrophe is to mourn. Mara, ready for the next slide. Okay. In the meanwhile, the king's officers came to their city, which was Modin, to make them sacrifice. They're making the Jews make bad sacrifices. And when many of Israel came to them, Mattathias also and his sons came together. Then answered the king's officers and said to Mattathias, Thus art thou art a ruler and an honorable and great man in this city and strengthened with sons and bre brethren. Now, therefore, you, Mattathias, come first and fulfill the king's commandment. You come sacrifice the way that Antiochus wants you to. And Mattathias answered and spake in a loud voice, thou, though all the nations that are under the king's dominion obey him and fall away every one from the religion of their fathers and give consent to his commandments, yet Will I and my sons and my brethren walk in the covenant of our fathers? God forbid that we should forsake the laws and the ordinances. We will not hearken to the king's word to go from our religion, either to the right hand or the left. Borrowing some Deuteronomic language, we are only going to obey the God of Israel. No way. Okay, next slide. Now, when he had left off speaking these words, there came one of the Jews in the sight of all to sacrifice on the altar, which was at Modin, according to the king's commandment. Some other schlub, some other Jewish schlub steps forward to sacrifice the way the king um, has commanded. And when, which thing, when Mattathias saw, he was so inflamed with zeal, wherefore he ran and slew him on the altar. Okay, some other Jew steps forward to make the sacrifice and Mattathias runs forward and kills the guy right on the altar. It's a rather grotesque image and rather arresting if you think about the fact that the Bible prohibits human sacrifice. And what he has done is basically made a set, given the appearance of making a sacrifice of one of his own fellow Jews on the altar. Uh, he's not done. Then um, also the king's commissioner who compelled men to sacrifice. He killed at that time. Okay, he kills the king's commissioner and he pulls down the altar and then dealt, and he, thus he dealt zealously for the law of God, like as Phineas did unto Zambri, the son of Salom. Okay, this is a reference to Pinchas, who you might remember from the book of Numbers is also very zealous for the law and kills a couple caught in adultery in, in anger because adultery is uh, against God's law. And then Mattathias cried throughout the city with a loud voice saying, whoever is zealous for the law and maintaineth the covenant, let him follow me. And he and his sons fled into the mountains and left all that ever they had in the city. Then many that sought the, after justice and judgment went down into the wilderness to dwell there, both they and their children and their wives and their cattle. Okay, the whole operation moves. He and his sons and their families move into the hills. OK, it's a very interesting, I think, kind of echo of Moses in the book of Exodus, right? In the book of Exodus, Moses slays an Egyptian and then is forced to flee. Here, Mattathias slays one of his own and is forced to flee. Um, so I think there's we're meant to understand him as a kind of Moses here, although um, I think it's a little bit um, disturbing because he's not just slaying the task. It's not just slaying the taskmaster. Um, it's, it's slaying the actual Jew, the victim here. Okay, so let's let's find out what happens next, because it gets even a little more disturbing if we just read a little bit further, at least in my view. Okay, I'm sorry for the small type. Hope everybody can read this. Um, now, when it was told to the king's servants what had happened, right? He killed the Jew, he killed the king's commissioner, he tore down the altar. They pursued him after them with a great number, and having overtaken them, they camped against them and made war against them on the Sabbath day. Um, Howbeit they, i.e. the Jews, answered them not, neither cast they a stone at them, nor stopped the places where they lay hid. Okay, so the king's army is now attacking the Maccabees on Shabbat, and the Jews who are observing Shabbat do not defend themselves, okay, because that would be violating the Sabbath. They don't even block up the caves where they are hiding. But they said, let us die in all in our innocency. Heaven and earth will testify for us that ye put us to death wrongfully. So they rose up against them in battle on the Sabbath, and they slew them with their wives and their children and their cattle to the number of a thousand people. 
Now, when Mattathias and his friends understood what was going on, that all their people were getting killed on Shabbat because they were not defending themselves, they mourned for them right sore. Um, And one of them said to another, if we all do as our brethren have done and fight not for our lives and laws, they will quickly root us out of the earth. Okay, we've gone quickly from idealist to practical because he says it now at that time, therefore, they decreed whosoever shall make shall come to make battle with us on the Sabbath day. We will fight against him. Okay. And so now they decide that they're going to need to break the Sabbath to fight the Greeks, right? The, what he was, the law, he was willing to kill somebody else to stop defending. He's willing to break, to save his own neck and to win this war. Okay. And then Mattathias and his friends went round about and they pulled down altars. In addition to fighting, they're busy pulling down altars. And what children soever they found within the coast of Israel uncircumcised, they circumcised valiantly. They go valiantly circumcising Israelite children against their will. And they recovered the law out of the hands of the Gentiles and out of the hand of the king. Neither suffered they, the sinner, to triumph. Okay. Uh, Mary, I think that's everything I brought from Maccabees. Yes? Okay. So, I think it's, if we think about this for a few minutes, it's not too difficult to understand why the rabbis, why there might have been some anxiety about putting this text in the Hebrew Bible. Um, If you uh, are a regular and joined me last summer for our our discussion of um, the destruction of the temple, the the Talmud story of the destruction of the temple in Gitin, you might remember that there the rabbis said the temple was destroyed as a result of sinat chinam, of baseless hatred. And two things that led to the destruction of the temple in that text were Jew on Jew violence and zealotry. And that's a lot of what we see in the book of Maccabees. Okay, Uh, so the Maccabees never made it into the Hebrew Bible. Ironically, by the way, does anyone know how we have the book of Maccabees at all? Um, The way that we have it is because it seems that the Greek-speaking Alexandrian Jews preserved it in Greek, and that's right, it made its way into the Christian canon. So ironically, the story of Jewish religious preservation made its way to us through a non-Jewish um, route in a in a Greek in the Greek language, no less, um, which is always a little irony about Maccabees. It's um, fun to notice. Okay, so the Maccabees don't make it into the Hebrew Bible, and we and and this is of course speculative on my part about why, but it seems like there, this text could have been very troubling. But here's something that not everybody realizes: the Maccabees are not in the Bible. But that doesn't mean none of this story is in the Bible because someone else from the story is in the Bible. And that actually is Antiochus. Um, The the evil king Antiochus is in the Bible and um, extra points if anybody knows where. Where in the Bible do we have Antiochus? It is is tricky. Ah, Lori's Lori's fast on the trigger. Yeah, it is in the book of Daniel. Um, And you'd be forgiven for not knowing that for a couple of reasons. One is that Antiochus is never mentioned by name. He's only mentioned in code in the book of Daniel. Um, And another reason is that Jews just don't read the book of Daniel all that much, right? It's not read in synagogue um, regularly like so many of the other scriptures are. Oh, this 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 is a really learned crowd. You guys are anticipating everything I'm going to say. Okay, so so let me let we're going to look at Antiochus and Daniel for a minute because I think it's an interesting point of comparison to this story of the Maccabees. Um, if so, so you so there are basically in the Bible two books that are really interested and concerned in questions of Jews in diaspora, and those are Esther and Daniel. And there's a lot of parallels between them in both of them. Uh, Thea teaches Daniel to her to her to her sixth graders. Good. Okay. Um, It's a strange book, though. It's a very strange book. Um, Props to you for teaching that to sixth graders. Okay. So Esther and Daniel are in, uh, are are these two stories of how to basically survive under foreign rule, under kings who are not necessarily all the time evil, but easily pushed into a place where they're very dangerous to the Jewish people. And both of them survive in part by getting close to power, right? Esther becomes the wife of the king and Daniel becomes the advisor to the king. Um, But they also have very different messages in some ways 
about survival in diaspora with uh, under a dangerous empire. And in Daniel, um, in Daniel, a lot of those messages are contained in visions that are coded, which is why you would be forgiven for not knowing that Antiochus is there. So I'm going to I'm going to show you one of those visions now. Um, yes. OK. Parrots is uh is pointing out, I, I, I agree with you completely, Parrots, that Daniel is a primary text for Christian seminarians and the last text studied in the yeshiva. Yes, I think of these two books, Jews love Esther and Christians tend to prefer Daniel. That's just my sense of it. And once we read this dream from Daniel, you'll see exactly why. I think it will make it very clear. Um, okay, so let's take a look at Daniel's dream. Remember, this is all going to be in code. But uh, we will explain it for you. Some of it is explained in the book. It's, it's pretty well understood what the code means. Okay, this is sometimes Daniel interprets dreams for others, but this is actually a dream that Daniel himself has. Okay, in my vision at night, says Daniel, I saw the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. Four mighty beasts different from each other emerged from the sea. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. And as I looked on, its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted off the ground and set on its feet like a man and given the mind of a man. Then I saw a second different beast, which was like a bear, but raised on one side and with three fangs in its mouth among its teeth. And it was told, arise, eat much meat. After that, as I looked on, there was another. This is the third beast, like a leopard. And it had on its back four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. After that, as I looked on in the night vision, there was a fourth beast, fearsome, dreadful, and very powerful, with great iron teeth that devoured and crushed and stamped the remains with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts which had gone before it, and it had ten horns. Okay, four beasts. Um, it's going to become clear uh, in the interpretation of the dream, and if you know Daniel in general, that these are empires. These are beasts are standing in for empires. While I was gazing on these horns, a new little horn sprouted up among them. Three of the older horns were uprooted to make room for it. There were eyes in this horn like those of a man and a mouth that spoke arrogantly. Okay, this little arrogant horn on the very last of the four beasts, it was understood both in antiquity and by modern scholars that this is actually Antiochus. He's the little arrogant, the arrogantly speaking horn that uproots Three other horns. Um, Mayor, if you go one more slide over, I brought a I brought a woodcut that shows the beasts. Um, it's not a very image heavy presentation, but um, there you can see the first beast is the what did we say? It was like in a lion with eagle's wings, and then a bear, and then a leopard with four heads and four wings, and then finally the beast with ten horns, and um, then the one horn that supplants three horns and speaks arrogantly. Um, okay, how do we know this is Antiochus? Um, it, it, there are a lot of, so, so I'm not going to do a detailed presentation on that because I, I, that would slow us to, down too much and not necessarily be so much interest. But um, Antiochus, when he was born, was actually fourth in line to the, the throne. Uh, and he became king after his brothers and two of his brother's sons were murdered. Um, Daniel seems to imply that he did the murdering. It's not clear historically if he killed all of them. Um, that's how he took the throne. And the arrogance is also a good clue that we're talking about Antiochus. Antiochus, you might remember, called himself Theos Epiphanes, meaning God manifest. And that would match the arrogance of the horn. There are a lot of other clues in the book of Daniel that this is Antiochus. Um, but it's thought that the book was written possibly during the Antiochian persecutions, which is why they can't say explicitly. Um, yes, it is parallel to Daniel's um, explanation of the, the statue in Nebuchadnezzar with different metals, which are also various empires. This, I, this idea of empires that rise and fall and overtake one another until the last one is defeated is, um, is repeated throughout the book of Daniel and is common in general in apocalyptic literature, of which Daniel is considered uh, one of the early examples. Okay, so let's finish Daniel's vision. We now have, okay, we have these four beasts that represent empire upon empire upon empire upon empire, culminating in this little horn that's Antiochus. Now let's see how, how we get rid of him, okay? As I looked on, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was like white snow and the hair of his head was like lamb's wool. His throne was tongue 
was tongues of flame. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire streamed forth before him. Thousands upon thousands served him. Myriads upon myriads attended him. And then because the arrogant Because of the arrogant words that the horn spoke, the beast was killed as I looked on, its body was destroyed, and it was consigned to the flames. Okay? Anyone have a guess who the Ancient of Days is? I capitalized all the, this this translation capitalizes all of the pronouns associated with it, which is a big clue about how this is usually understood. Um, Also notice that that the Ancient of Days rides, rides a fiery, thrown with wheels. This should, this, this evokes, um, for instance, visions in Ezekiel of the divine throne. Yeah, this is, this is God. Um, and the, this is confusing sometimes to people because it's surprisingly anthropomorphic for a description of God in the Hebrew Bible, but there are these places in the Bible that are more anthropomorphic in their descriptions of God. Um, uh, so this is God coming down in a spaceship, in a Merkava, in a, in a, in a divine chariot. God spends a lot of time in the Bible, especially if you read the Psalms, riding around the heavens in a, in a pretty cool chariot. And sometimes prophets cap, catch sight of him. For instance, Ezekiel in the first chapter. Um, okay, so, so notice how Antiochus is defeated. It's no, there's no battle with people. It's just God is going to show up and crush the whole empire. That's what's going to happen. We have just a little more in this vision. So Mara, if you would take us to the end, um, this is less strictly related, but I think it's helpful to see it. Okay, his vision continues. As I looked on in the night vision, one like a human being came with the clouds of heaven. He reached the ancient of days and was presented to him. Dominion, glory, and kingship were given to him. All peoples and nations of every language must serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so now we have a new character that joins this scene, like a human being coming on the clouds of heaven, who now is get, who now the Ancient of Days has appointed to have eternal dominion. Any ideas what we're what we're looking at here? Yeah, Joshua, we're looking at a messianic figure. Right, the defeat of Antiochus by God is going to usher in a messianic era, a totally new era of history where all peoples are united under the rule of one that God will choose, that God will appoint. Yes. So obviously, if you're if you're a Christian and this is in your scripture, I don't want to speak too much for Christians, but right, this is where you would see Jesus in this text, right? You would see them in, in the messianic passage here. I'm, I I don't want to speak for Christianity, but yes, um, I think that's generally how it how it is read. Um, and of course, as we know, this this vision that Daniel has, it, it didn't actually like the end of Antiochus didn't usher in a messianic era, but this was the Daniel's vision for what this crisis, this crisis was so bad and so difficult and bad times do tend to inspire this kind of apocalyptic messianic type end of days type of thinking that um, this is the understanding of how that crisis will come to an end. It's kind of almost the exact inverse of what we find in Maccabees, right? Maccabees is all about a band of brave heroes who are gonna fight and defeat the enemy. And this has no human involvement. This is this is God's gonna do it for us, okay? And so this is actually um, where Antiochus shows up in the Hebrew Bible. We have none of the Maccabees, but we do have this, which I think is really interesting. Okay. I want to keep moving us along um, to make sure we get through everything I had in mind to present. So let's go back now with this in mind, let's go back to the Talmud and let's go back to um, Shabbat 21 in more detail um, and see what the sages say about Hanukkah in a little more detail. Okay. So Mara, thank you for the slide. Um, This is toward the top of the discussion on Hanukkah, which um, is elicited by a conversation about how to light um, Shabbat lamps. And while we're talking about Shabbat, lamp, Shabbat lamps, we'll talk about how to, the mitzvah of lighting the Hanukkah lamp, the one and only mitzvah associated with Hanukkah. Okay, the sage is taught. The mitzvah, mitzvah of Hanukkah is a light for a person and his household. Okay, that's it. The mitzvah of Hanukkah is you have to light a light for your household, just one. And the mihadrin, i.e. those who are very meticulous in the performance of mitzvot, Kindle a light for each and every one in the household. So if you have three family members, you light three lights. 
And the mihadrin min hamihadrin, the most meticulous in the performance of mitzvot. Okay, well, but now we have a debate. Beit Shammai says on the first day, one kindles eight lights and from there on gradually decreases. And Beit Hillel says on the first day, one kindles one light and from there on gradually increases. Okay, so the rabbinic idea is that the, the, the mitzvah of Hanukkah is really just one light for the household, but the most meticulous will do what looks more familiar to us and light eight lights, either one building up to eight or eight building back down to one. And of course, we know, as usual, Hillel um, wins this debate. And that's what we do today. We light one candle on the first night and we build up to eight. Um, okay, from here, I'm going to skip a bunch of material, but I'll tell you briefly what's there. They, they The rabbis now have a debate about why Hillel and Shammai hold their positions. Why does one think increase? Why does one think decrease? Why eight? <laughs> That's debated. Um, it's not clear to them. And uh, then also things that may be familiar to you in terms of like you, it's a, it's a mitzvah to put it at the entrance of your house so that it's visible. But um, in times of danger, you actually, they say you can keep it inside. So it's not visible if there's another persecution happening. And also the requirement um, that these lights can't be used for purposes of work. If you need light for, for a useful purpose, you need to use another light. Um, okay, and then we come to this. So Mara, ready for the next slide. One of my favorite lines about Hanukkah in the Talmud. What's Hanukkah? <laughs> okay, then the sages say, but what is Hanukkah anyway, right? It seems like they might not be sure. They might not be sure. They don't assume that all of their colleagues know. Um, and the answer is quoted. The sages taught on the 25th of Kislev, the days of Hanukkah are eight. One may not eulogize on them and one may not fast on them. Okay, this is quoted like it's a brighta and it is actually um, a direct quotation from Migilat Tanit. This is how Migilat Tanit reads that calendar of the days on which it is not permissible to fast. And on some of them, it's not permissible to publicly mourn. And then the sages explain, when the Greeks entered the temple, they defiled all the oils that were in the sanctuary. And when the Hasmonean monarchy overcame them and emerged victorious over them, they searched and found only one cruise of oil that was placed with the seal of the high priest. And there was sufficient oil there to light the menorah only one day. A miracle occurred and it lit the menorah for eight days. The next year, the sages instituted those days and made them holidays with recitation of Hallel and special Thanksgiving prayer and blessings. Oh my goodness, there's a there's a lot going on in the chat and it's hard for me to work on this presentation and follow all of it. But Mara, if there's anything you want to draw my attention to, please please feel free to. Uh, what I want us to notice here is that the sages aren't a hundred that not all sages are hundred percent sure about what Hanukkah is. They're not a hundred percent sure. And the version of the story they give is really light on the Maccabees, right? It's, it doesn't give, go into any detail about the military victory. It just says casually that the Hasmonean monarchy overcame them. And then it says that the miracle is about oil, not about the military victory. They shift the miracle from being about this military victory to being about this oil that burned for eight days, which is a nice little story that also that celebrates the moment of restoration of the temple and also has resonance with the mitzvah of lighting the light. Um, okay. So um, there's one more text that I brought to share today that I think will complicate this whole situation even further. Um, so we're going to flip over to that now. It's in Tractate Avodah Zarah, um, which uh, is the tractate about how to deal with idolatry and idolaters, how to live among them. And, um, and I, you know, we'll just dive in. I want to see what you guys think. Um, okay, so let's start with the Mishnah. All right. Now, these are the festivals of the Gentiles. We're talking about non-Jewish holidays. Um, Kalenda, Saturnalia, and Cretesis and the day of the festival of their kings, and the birthday of the king, and the anniversary of the death of the king. This is the statement of Rabbi Meir. Okay? These are Gentile festivals. Now, they're going to discuss them in the Gemara. So let's flip over to the Gemara here. Rav Hanan Bar Rava says, 
Kalenda is celebrated during the eight days after the winter solstice. And Saturnalia is celebrated during the eight days before the winter solstice. Okay, so we have these two, both of these festivals, two of these festivals mentioned in the Mishnah, they're eight day festivals that flank the winter solstice, one right before and one after. Okay, which should sound a little bit familiar already. And the sages thought, when Adam, the first man, saw that the day was progressively diminishing, um, and he said, Woe is me, perhaps because I sinned, the world is becoming dark around me and will return to chaos and disorder. And this is the death that was sentenced upon me from heaven, as it is written, and to dust you shall return. He arose and spent eight days in fasting and prayer. Now, um, remember when Adam was created. If you remember that Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the world, then you can remember that Adam is created in the fall, in this in the, the rabbinic imagination. And so there's the story they're telling is that when he was created, he saw that daylight, he was created at a time when daylight and nighttime were about even. And then um, as he lived in the world for a little while, he saw that the daylight was diminishing from day to day. And he became afraid that the world was going to revert to utter darkness, that the creation was undoing itself. And this would be the death that he had heard about. But once he saw that the season of Tevet had arrived and saw that the day was progressively lengthening, he said, this is the order of the world. Okay, Tevet is the month that follows Kislev. So Hanukkah starts the 25th of Kislev and the first of Tevet is toward the end of the, is sort of in the middle of the holiday. Um, so the holiday actually overlaps Kislev and Tevet and it is the season in which the winter solstice is usually contained, okay? Um, it's, it's a little tricky to peg the winter solstice exactly to a Hebrew month because it's a lunar calendar, but that's about when it usually arrives. Um, and once he saw, once he lived through that solstice and saw that the day is starting getting longer again, um, he's much relieved. And he went and observed a festival of eight days. Upon the next year, he observed both these and these as festivities, the days that he was um, fasting and hoping for the world not to be destroyed. And then the days that he was celebrating when he realized the world would not be destroyed. And he established these festivals for the sake of heaven, but they, the Gentiles established them for the sake of idol worship. Okay. So this is intriguing, right? First off, it's, we're talking about eight day festivals. There isn't much else in the Hebrew calendar that's eight days. Um, and we're talking about a festival around the winter solstice. And it's all about regaining light. It's a festival about light. So it sounds an awful lot like an awful lot like Hanukkah. Um, but what's interesting here to me is they understand um, these festivals as as universal, originally universal festivals that were available to everybody. That's they, they light them. In, I'm sorry. They root them in Adam. Adam understands these to be an Adam's experience, making them universal human festivals in the human festivals about light in the darkness and that were established for the sake of heaven. And then were later sort of corrupted by the by the gentiles who established them for the sake of idol worship and and I, I don't know a lot about these festivals in in um saturnalia and so forth but but it it stands to reason that idol worship would have been a part of them so i'm curious what you guys think what do you make of all this um cuz i i i don't think um i i tend to think that what we're seeing here, okay, now people are, are coming back at me with eight days. Yes, Shemini on Sarah and Sukkot, right? But Sukkot is really inherently seven days. Passover is inherently seven days, and then the plus one makes eight. But there's nothing like that with Hanukkah. Hanukkah is an eight-day festival. Um, and what I'm inclined to think might be sort of going on in the ancient world is that we do have this sort of universal pull to have an eight-day festival around the solstice. And the sages are even saying it's a universal 
thing to have an eight day festival around the solstice. It was established by Adam and the other layers on it, whether it's the, it's the Gentiles who are making it, um, who, who, who have established it as an idolatrous festival or the Hasmoneans who perhaps have established it as, uh, as connected to their military victory are later. It seems to me that, that they're hinting that there's some sort of universal origin to Hanukkah. But I'm curious what you guys think, because I don't, I don't think I have all the answers necessarily here. I just think this is such an interesting and suggestive text. This is, this is why I titled this talk, the Hanukkah story you um, never heard before, because it strikes me that this could work exactly as an origin story for Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah about? It's about that time that Adam thought that the world was going to be destroyed, that creation was going to be undone, and then realized that the winter would not um, slowly progress into utter darkness and that God would bring the light back, right? That's a great reason to have a winter festival. Um, okay. Um, I'm not aware of a connection to harvesting or planting. Uh, yeah, it sounds like folks need a holiday around the solstice because it's just too grin. Fear of darkness is primal. Judaism would have adapted a longstanding festival in the interest to attract followers. Um, of course, I don't know that, you know, um, that this was originally an Adam and Eve festival. It kind of sounds to me like this is, was originally a non-Jewish festival that they're giving an Adam and Eve veneer to, right? Um, yeah, the Christians did the same thing, right? Roman Saturnalia is is behind, is, is lends, certain aspects to Christmas. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Lots of good comments. All right. So what I, what I wanted to leave you with, um, okay. Another can't, sorry, uh, reading and talking at the same time. It's difficult. Uh, another can you real, um, okay. All right. What I would, I'm sorry. <laughs> The comments are coming a little too fast for me. <laughs> I'm not good at the multitasking. What I would, um, but I'm glad you're discussing and inspired to 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 share reactions to all of this stuff. Um, I I don't have a um, a neat way to bundle it all up for us, but what I want us to notice um, is these very different these rooms this room in Judaism for these very different understandings. Just if we think purely about the Antiochian persecution, right? And the responses. Maccabees has one response. It's fight zealously. And Daniel has another response. It's sit back and wait for God to sort them out. Um, and, it, you know, if we lump Esther in here, we see sort of a midway between those two for a response to um, persecution. And we also have these different ideas about Hanukkah. Is it about the Maccabean victory? which is more human in origin? Is it about the miracle of the oil, which is more divine in origin? Um, or can we understand it as having a more universal theme? Is, does it have something to do with Adam and Eve uh, and, and experiencing the very first existential crisis in humanity, the near un what they mistook for the undoing of creation and gladness for the fact that the world renews itself each spring and that light comes back. Is it that kind of freedom that we're celebrating? And I think the fact that um, we saw so much ambivalence about Hanukkah in the in the rabbinic text and so much, um, you know, like maybe we should even cancel it, maybe, um, and, and, and maybe we're not even sure what it's about, gives room, I think, for us, if we wish, in our own Hanukkah experience, um, to incorporate some, of, to widen our understanding of the holiday and incorporate some of these ideas if they are appealing, because they are also um, genuine Jewish thoughts about celebrating light during the winter. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. I think, um, and I now maybe I'll, um, yeah. Okay, all right, um, Mara. I'm seeing some people would like a link to the slides. So, um, so now we'll, we'll do business for a minute. Um, we'll, uh, Mara can provide a link to the fly, slides. Thank you, Mara. And um, I think also, usually Mara, we create some sort of PDF or something from the slides at the end, and we will send it out by email as a follow-up to the class if you would like to look at these sources again. Yes. Um, okay, wonderful. 
Okay. So Thea says, can we infer that the oil story is in fact a story that it didn't really happen? Uh, you know, Thea, I, in, I am a little nervous about um, saying whether any of this happened. In some of my research for this talk, I read a really interesting article by Stephen Katz. Um, no, Stephen shoot, I've forgotten his last name. He's at the Cat Center. Really interesting scholar. And I, his name is completely out of my head. And he points out that this kind of Antiochian persecution, where we crush the religion of the people we're trying to dominate, Antiochus was really after Egypt and Israel was just in his way. But it, Israel wasn't his goal. Egypt was his goal. But this kind of Antiochian persecution was very unusual for the ancient world. Most ancient... Um, Weitzman, thank you, Stephen Weitzman. <laughs> um, most ancient, um, most ancient uh, emperors found that it was far more um, convenient to let people keep their religious tradition. You could you you could actually keep people in better line. They, were, they tended to be far more religiously tolerant. And and this description we have in Daniel and in Maccabees of a tyrant who was so strong, strongly persecuting the Jewish people because of their religion um, is something scholars have a little bit called into question whether that even happened because it just doesn't make sense for an ancient emperor. Now, maybe he was just um, off his rocker and it wasn't good politics on his part, right? It didn't work out very well for him and maybe he really did it, but there's some question in the scholarship, even whether, um, even whether that happened. So I don't like to pronounce too much on the history. The sources are thin. There are other sources for the Maccabees, but not so many. Um, and so it is really hard to say historically what happened. Um, so I tried to keep the focus more on what does the holiday mean? What did the holiday mean for ancient peoples? And what are different ideas about what it meant that were circulating and anxieties about the different interpretations and what it meant? Um, um, okay. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. It was really nice to, um, to read your comments and learn from your thoughts and share some of this material, just because I find it so interesting to think about in the run-up to Hanukkah. And I wish you all, um, a holiday filled with lots of light for eight days and religious freedom um, and freedom from the destruction of the world and uh, anything else that you are hoping for at this holiday season. Okay, thank you, everybody. It was nice to be here.